uh, and uh, hello, uh, welcome to those of you who are, are listening and, and watching. And uh, I want to say a few words uh, of welcome uh, to uh, Dr. Michael Higgins, who is uh, presenting today from Guelph in Ontario. So it's four o'clock for us, seven o'clock for him. I hope you've had your dinner already, uh, Michael. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, before introduction, just a couple of things I'd like to uh, bring to people's attention. Uh, Gordon has already mentioned uh, that uh, the Graduate and Faculty Christian Forum uh, has been around. Actually, this is its 34th year, I believe. We meet approximately once a month during the academic year uh, to talk uh, around, to discuss uh, issues of uh, faith, uh, society, uh, and scholarship. Um, and our next presentation, in fact, I should just mention that, then I, I won't forget to do it at the end, uh, is a very interesting, uh, promises to be a very interesting presentation from Daniel Williams, who's a professor of history in the US. Uh, and he's written a couple of books about the church and Christian faith uh, in the context of the culture and political wars uh, in the US, uh, his most recent book, and Erdman's book, The Politics of the Cross, A Christian Alternative to Partisanship. So I think that is an incredibly uh, current issue uh, and he'll be presenting on October 25th. Uh, a second point, this is a bit unusual to, to raise the, an issue like this, but uh, a good friend of this group in recent years has been Dr. Tom McLeish. Uh, uh, of Durham and then later York University in the UK. And uh, we understand that Tom is seriously ill uh, in Britain. And uh, I would encourage uh, those of us uh, who are in the habit of praying uh, to pray uh, for Tom uh, and uh, his family. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Higgins, and I, I want to thank him uh, so much for sharing his, uh, his wisdom with us. Uh, we met Michael, uh, I say we, um, that is not the royal plural, there were two of us, uh, Gordon and myself. We had a very pleasant lunch with him uh, last spring, early summer, uh, wh while he was the uh, interim uh, president of, um, well, he was the president of Corpus Christi College at UBC and the interim principal uh, of St. Mark's College. Um, he's now uh, back in Ontario and has just had uh, a wonderful uh, piece of news. And that is that he has been awarded the Basilian Distinguished Fellowship uh, of Contemporary Catholic Thought uh, at St. Michael's College uh, at the U of T, uh, a three-year fellowship, um, which those of us uh, who are in a similar emeritus position to his uh, can only get, uh, be tempted to be incredibly envious of. Uh, it's all luck. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great acknowledgement of, of a splendid career as an author, scholar, public intellectual. Uh, his name features common, uh, commonly uh, in the Globe and Mail. Uh, he's a commentator for the CTV network. Uh, he has been uh, an administrator, a president uh, of two Canadian Catholic universities. And he is a scholar of note, uh, having uh, written uh, biographies of John Henry Newman, Henry Nouwen, Jean Vanier, uh, and especially Thomas Merton, uh, where he is uh, an accomplished and well-recognized well scholar. Uh, some 10 years or so ago, uh, Michael co-authored a book entitled, Suffer the Children Unto Me. Uh, and of course, many of you will recognize that uh, directly uh, from um, the uh, the New Testament, uh, this, uh, some, uh, 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 a, 
a sentence pronounced by Jesus. Uh, and of course, what triggered that has been the heartbreaking uh, and sadly repeated uh, cases of clerical abuse of children. Uh, Michael it then is, I think, bravely uh, addressing an issue that so many people uh, inside and outside the church are much happier uh, to forget about than to actually uh, address. So Michael, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to do this today. Uh, after Michael's presentation of 40, 45 minutes, there will be an uh, opportunity uh, for question, uh, question and answer, uh, which you can, uh, you can do by uh, using uh, 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 your, your sound uh, equipment, or you can send uh, a question through the chat room. So, Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for that, uh, for that kind introduction. I, um, I'm going to talk about a delicate topic tonight, um, and uh, it's a kind of a no-holds-barred discussion. I, I have nothing especially to defend, but I, I do think that this is an ongoing issue. I'm going to talk about it specifically in the context of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, uh, David alluded to a book that I wrote called Suffer the Children Unto Me, an uh, open inquiry into the clerical sex abuse scandal. I did it with a lawyer friend of mine, a producer at the CBC, Peter Cavanaugh, now sadly deceased. Um, and we took both a legal, theological, but also social, cultural and political perspective to examine the work. Um, it's interesting as a footnote, because now it came out in 2010, now it's 2022. So it's not quite the same, but at the time, it won an award uh, in ethics in the United States and in Canada, it was an, uh, an effort placed on the publisher to suppress the book, um, which is astonishing <laughs> in 2010 that anyone would even think of doing such a thing. But it did speak to the alarm many people have about discussing this uh, in public. And as a consequence, as we know, it's simple, basic Freudian psychoanalysis. When you suppress something, you put it out of sight, you drive it into the dark corners of, the conscious, of your consciousness, it comes back. You never exercise it. It's never, it all, things can only be faced in the light. Um, and as a consequence, this shadow side of the Roman Catholic Church needs to be faced and it needs to be discussed and strategies of reform and correction need to be implemented. Now, let me be clear, um, this is not unique to the Roman Catholic Church. There is sex abuse in every religious denomination. And there are instances that arise occasionally that are quite startling. Um, a Hasidic rabbi and a cantor and school teacher in, in Brooklyn that rocked the community. Uh, Mennonite instances across Canada and the, and the States where there, uh, there are uh, examples of sustained and serial abuse. And in the other major denominations as well, including the many evangelical denominations and Pentecostal. So it is not a problem that's unique to the Roman Catholic Church. This is a pathology that affects all institutions. I need only remind you that the Canadian military is a test case for the, this problem itself. We can't even get a commanding general of our army who is not subject to investigation, review, or dismissal. It's absolutely astonishing. I was talking recently to a friend of mine who worked as a uh, director of ministry, music ministry, at one of the universities I was president at in, in Waterloo many years ago, and his daughter is a major in the Canadian army, and she's um, had a tour both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And her husband is uh, also a major doing doctoral work at the Royal Military College, and she's leaving the military. And she's 38, stellar career. So I asked her father, why? And he said, because of the rot at the top. I mean, it's just not going away. Now, we also have countless examples from Sport and Hockey Canada. The entertainment industry is replete with examples of sexual abuse and predation, some of it's so startling, it's, it's mind-numbing. I say this not by way of, ex, of excuse or to minimize 
the damage inflicted on the Roman Catholic community by errant clergy who are either predators as pedophiles or uh, directly abusers. But to put it within the larger context, correcting the pathologies of sexual abuse will involve more than simply addressing the issue in the context of Roman Catholic ministry. It is a much broader, deeper, and ubiquitous problem. Perhaps because it came to light most aggressively through um, Roman Catholic clergy that we tend still to think of that as the uh, primary problem. But I think as I've provided you now with several examples, you can see that this is by no means uniquely confined to the Roman Catholic Church and its ministry. But it will be that that I'm going to talk about tonight in looking at a couple of specific instances and then opening it up for a very um, frank conversation and I hope an honest one. So if you have some concerns you want to raise, you, have, you can most certainly do so in the context of what I've said or perhaps what I've, what I've omitted. But keeping in mind that although I am a Roman Catholic myself, and I've been a president of three Catholic universities. I write for both Catholic journals and publications. I am a layman. I am not a cleric. And therefore, I don't have any specific authority to speak on behalf of the institutional church. I'm a believer in that church, but I'm not empowered to serve as a spokesperson for the church. When Pope Francis met uh, within the last year, with Michel Aupetit, the Archbishop of Paris, and other French bishops at the end of September of 2021, he observed on the matter of the then forthcoming report on sex abuse in the Church of France. He said, look truth in the face. Look truth in the face. Interestingly enough, as a sidebar, Archbishop Opiti, a physician, by the way, as well as an archbishop, resigned his office, not for sex abuse by any means, but because of allegations of a intimate relationship with a woman, uh, which he denied, but has maintained a strong friendship with this woman. Hardly seems to be grounds for <laughs> resignation of an archbishop, but nonetheless, it, it, uh, it happened, but it's unrelated to any abuse. It is not only the hierarchy that is now doing so, looking truth in the face, but all of France, Catholic and otherwise. Indeed, the world has taken a shot notice. Let me remind you, if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, it's called the Sauvé Report. It was an investigation commissioned by the French bishops in the year 2018 in the wake of a series of clerical sex abuse scandals, and it was issued on October the 5th of 2021. The tremors of disbelief, outrage, and horror continue to this day reverberating throughout France. The statistical tally is staggering. In fact, I find it, uh, I've been chronicling these kinds of things for a number of years and writing commentaries. I, I find this difficult actually to comprehend. 216,000 people were sexually abu abused by clerics since 1950, with an additional 114,000 abused by lay people in ecclesiastical service. The number of accused priests in France is conservatively estimated at 3,000. Now, Jean-Marc Sauvé is a retired senior civil servant. He's a judge and he's a practicing Catholic. He berated the church for showing, and I quote, a profound and total, even cruel indifference to the victims. And he acknowledged publicly that he sought out psychological help himself after listening to the experiences of some of the survivors. His report was comprehensive, drawing on numerous experts in jurisprudence, in history, in theology, in psychology, psychiatry, and sociology. More than 6,000 victims were canvassed for their input or interviewed. Working closely with various polling bodies, Mr. Sauvé and his commissioners 
took several years to do their work, and they presented their findings to the church, already capable of deep shock. In commenting in La Croix Internationale, the leading French Catholic publication, Jesuit theologian and university rector Etienne Gru anguished, and I quote, how is it that we did not dare to say out loud what we were witnessing in secret? And how is it that we did not give credit to those who had the courage to alert us? Answering these questions has been a global dilemma for many Roman Catholics. How many times have we been in this same place? How many commissions and reports before Mr. Sobe's have asked the same things, probed similar pathologies, excoriated bishops for not exercising a gospel-centered pastoral oversight by privileging errant clerics over suffering victims, and seeking, often vainly, to change the structures that enable such abuse to occur in the first place. Before France, there was Germany, England, and Wales, Ireland, Canada, the United States, Australia, Chile, and on it goes. Before the Soviet Commission report, there was the Winters report in Canada, the Ryan report in Ireland, the Nolan report in England, and numerous others. And the number of films, for instance, the film Fall, documentaries like Deliver Us From Evil, plays like doubt, novels like The Bishop's Man, and scholarly studies from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice are in fact legion. Now everybody's talking about it. The universally agreed upon diagnosis is multi-layered. A romanticized conception of priesthood that removed the priest from regular human commerce. A rampant clericalism that ensured a power imbalance that facilitated clerical predation. The subordination of victim needs to the higher priority of maintaining the church's good name. The failure of seminaries to nurture mature psychosexual growth. For those Catholics who call out for meaningful and transparent reform, and their number, I can tell you, is growing by the minute, Patience for this often Sisyphean undertaking has been replaced by a crushing demoralization. And I suspect it isn't just the laity who are demoralized. Countless priests, nuns and monks, persisting with personal fidelity to their lives of religious service under the shadow of this dark history, continue to carry their own overwhelming feelings of shame and betrayal. No less a figure than the vice president of the German Bishops' Conference, Franz Josef Roda, has remarked that during his many conversations with sex abuse victims, there were times when he nearly lost his faith. And I suspect that he is not alone in this. A month before the release of the Sove report, Thomas Halleck, a renowned Catholic priest, scholar, psychotherapist, and winner of the Templeton Prize, spoke at an international um, conference in Warsaw about the scandal of abusive priests. In his address, he argued that, and I quote, the situation of the Catholic Church today strongly resembles the situation just before the Reformation of the 16th century. It is necessary not just to change structures, but to change the mentality, to change the culture of relationships within the church." End of quote. Father Halleck insists that the abuse crisis is just one aspect of the larger crisis of the clergy itself, indeed of the church and of faith. How Catholics approach this crisis will determine the future shape of the church as in Father Halleck's words, and I quote, a place of encounter, sharing, and reconciliation, end of quote. But first, as Pope Francis exhorted the French bishops, 
we need to look truth in the face. That is not easy. Well, as you can see, it's not easy in the media industry. It's not easy in Sports Canada. They continue to, uh, to evade responsibility and accountability. As I said earlier, it's rampant in the military. So we have to keep this again contextually in uh, a larger historical framework rather than just simply talk about this as if it were a Christian issue and more specifically a Roman Catholic one. I am addressing the Roman Catholic dimension of this because it's the larger one. The Roman Catholic Church has over 1 billion members and the, the eruption of this clerical sex abuse crisis has been more dramatic, immediate and, and intense in the Catholic communion than it has been in other denominations. That is a result proportionately of its size, but also of its structure. I have come across several, and I believe it myself, uh, when historians and others say that this is the greatest crisis the Catholic Church has faced since the Reformation. I think that that's correct. This is the greatest crisis we're facing. So where does it go with the truth? Well, we had a very dark week during the summer for the Catholic Church of Canada. A class action suit against dozens of clergy, hundreds in the Archdiocese of Quebec, seem like just another sadly predictable iteration of a common theme, the enduring legacy of clerical sex abuse. And this happened just after Pope Francis left to return to Rome. It is a reminder, as one venerable Monsignor remarked to me, that it is like Chinese water torture. Would it ever come to a merciful end? Would it ever come to an end at all? The recent revelation, that is very recent, last August, was shattering owing to the inclusion of allegations against one of the princes of the church, Cardinal Mark Ouellette. Now the allegations against the Cardinal have yet to be tested in the civil court. Although Pope Francis has concluded that there is insufficient evidence for a full canonical Vatican investigation that he issued la uh, la later in the month. Cardinal Wallet himself said he firmly denies the allegations, calling them defamatory. A woman currently identified as F alleges that while working for the Archdiocese as a pastoral agent during Cardinal Wallet's tenure as Archbishop of Quebec City from 2003 to 2010, he inappropriately touched her various times. She concluded later that his alleged behavior actually constituted sexual assault. In, in according to the rubrics of Canadian law. She complained to the archdiocesan authorities and then to the Pope himself. And that's where it stood until she joined a class action suit and the Cardinal's name surfaced in the context of other names. Again, nothing has been established about this. Now I am in no position to judge the merits or veracity of the charges. But the mere fact that the allegation now has public exposure raises genuine issues of abiding concern for reform-minded Catholics. This is uh, far from the first instance of a senior prelate like a cardinal finding himself at the heart of a controversy in involving sexual impropriety, assault, or predation. Hermann Groer, the Archbishop of Vienna from 1986 to 1995 was removed from office as a consequence of a multitude of complaints about his sexual behavior with seminarians. The tardiness of Rome's response, Pope John Paul II stood adamantly behind Cardinal Gruer for a very long period, seriously damaged the reputation of the Austrian church. Keith O'Brien, the Archbishop of St. Andrews, Edinburgh from 1985 to 2013, was the senior ranking UK prelate at the time, had to step down as a cardinal, a hitherto unprecedented action, and retired from public life because he was accused of sexually exploiting seminarians and young priests. He relinquished his right to attend and to vote in the conclave that elected Pope Francis, again, unprecedented. Theodore McCarrick, the Archbishop of Washington from 2001 to 2006, fell from grace with a thunderous ferocity. His well-chronicled history of allegedly seducing and exploiting young priests 
whom he nefariously dubbed his nephews, resulted in a minutely detailed report directly from the Vatican, culminating with his removal from the Cardinalate and his reduction to the lay state, the severest sanction that Rome can impose. Now, the most controversial case to date is actually the Australian Cardinal, George Pell, the Cardinal chosen by Pope Francis to introduce and preside over financial reforms of the Vatican economy. Cardinal Pell was accused of praying in altar boys while Archbishop of Melbourne from 1996 to 2001 and was extradited to his homeland. He was tried and he was sentenced to jail. Upon a successful appeal, his case was overturned and he has resumed residence in Rome and has been declared innocent. Now, time is the pool which card, this is the pool which Cardinal Wallet now finds himself. Whatever judgment or conclusion emerges in his case, the shadow, the very shadow of accusation alone, is sufficient to ensure that his status as papavale, which means that he's considered Pope material, is now permanently forfeited. Cardinal Wallet has held many portfolios inside and outside Rome. He's a polyglot an able administrator, highly uh, intelligent. He's a sound if conventional theologian and a cleric who believes in a vital priesthood and the efficacy of seminaries. In fact, he's a priest of the Société de Saint-Sulpice, a French-founded order committed specifically to the education of priests. It is a depressing irony that the scandals surrounding Cardinal Ballet and other clerics, about a hundred of them, are in part the result of seminary formation itself, the very incubator of the clericalism that infects the, infects the church from the top down. As the priest psychologist Henri Nouwen observed of his own seminary training in Holland, although the courses were interesting and the fraternity of like-minded individuals welcome, the two pivotal things he did not learn was how to pray and how to be intimate, the two indispensable qualities of an effective pastoral ministry. And by intimate, he did not mean an invitation for an erotic free-for-all. What he meant was being comfortable in your own skin, having an integrated sexuality, and being able to relate to all genders. Now, to achieve the latter, the church needs to re rethink how it actually shapes its priests. It needs to shift the mindset away from the clericalist mentality of entitlement and invulnerability and bring an end to the culture of abuse. I'm just going to quote from um, my book that came out with Peter Kavanaugh way back in 2010, uh, putting something in context that I think you might find rather important, although it's going to have a rather ironic twist at the very end, which I will allude to. This is near the end of the book. And we're talking about um, uh, a novel called The Long Run, written by a Newfoundland writer by the name of uh, Leo Fury. In his stunningly fair, non-vindictive and insightful novel, The Long Run, Newfoundlander Leo Fury recreated the immediacy and the terror of the Mount Cashel nightmare. You may remember that in the 1980s, Mount Cashel Orphanage in St. John's, Newfoundland was the seat of several investigations and reports concerning cruelty and sexual abuse by Irish Christian brothers and their lay staff. And it resulted eventually in very significant um, financial reparation, and also in the eventual destruction of Mount Cashel. You can't find it anywhere now. It was taken down stone by stone. So Leo uh, Fury recreated the immediacy of the terror of the Mount Cashel nightmare with his own fictional Mount Kildare orphanage for boys. Now, his treatment, unlike that of filmmaker John Smith and the Boys of St. Vincent, you may remember that film, is a more nuanced glimpse of life inside. In a scene, the only one of its kind, where the devastating pathology of sexual predation is portrayed with gripping intensity, 
The impact on the reader is magnified by the comparative economy of expression. Aidan Carmichael, the novel's narrator, paints the scene. This is what he says. The next morning after breakfast, we tell Blackie, who is the leader, what happened. And he says he isn't surprised there's a night stalker. And he isn't surprised that he stopped at Nolan's bed either. He says he knew as much. Nolan's going to the infirmary a lot. Always sick. No, not sick. Sad. But if Nolan isn't sick, if he's just sad, why does he go to the infirmary all the time? Does he always get the spells, I ask? Nolan's always sad, Oberstein says. That's a kind of sickness, always being sad. It's deep, deep inside him, Blakey says. It's soulful, a different kind of sickness. It's the sadness sickness, end of quote. Fury's portrait of the religious brothers who operate the school is intelligent and measured, discriminating and scrupulously considered. He refuses the easy appeal of stereotyping and recognizes that the brothers run the gamut from the seriously dysfunctional to the idealistic and the empathetic. There are the sociopaths and there are the saints. But mostly they are injured men, lonely, addicted to power, living out their lives in a church that is, is as much a prison for them as a gateway to holiness. Fury's sadness, sickness has penetrated the very pores of the Catholic Church in recent decades. Another Canadian, and one I highly recommend if you're unfamiliar with him, is the spiritual writer and the former president of the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas, a priest by the name of Ronald Roheiser. He offered his prescient prognosis in his June 22nd, 2002 syndicated column, years before the worst was to unfold on the global scene. And here's what Ron says, and I quote, we have to be prepared for a season, perhaps a long one, of continued pain and embarrassment and a further erosion of trust. We need to accept this without self-pity and without being overly self-protect. Partly, we are ill, though everyone is. And like a virus that has infected the body, this has to run its course. And the body, in fever and weakness, has to build up a new immune system. In a situation like this, there is only one thing to do. And the Book of Lamentations from the Hebrew Scriptures spells it out graphically. Put your mouth to the dust and wait. Put your mouth to the dust and wait. As the Roman Catholic Church builds up a new immune system, a system marked by transparency, openness to correction, institutional humility, and a zeal for purification, it is important to retain a perspective that is historical, proportionate, and free from polemical posturing and ideological rigidity. Perhaps there is no better source alive who can remind us of the essential truth rooted in the scriptures, be it meditated or mediated in the best traditions of the church, and a hallmark of our Christocentric humanism than another Canadian philosopher, who wrote, a human being is more than the power or capacity to think and to perform. There is a gentle person of love hidden in the child within the adult. The heart is the place where we meet others, where we suffer and rejoice with them. It is the place where we can identify and be in solidarity with them. Whenever we love, we are not alone." End of quote. When we remember the centrality of the heart, we will then understand Jesus's injunction to suffer the children to come unto me, and the gospel-driven imperative and judgment 
that accompanies Jesus's words. Okay, so that's the lecture part of the seminar. <laughs> and now we're opening up for a uh, question, answer, debate, or whatever. Are we? Why don't I, I start, uh, Michael, while others perhaps are, are shaping their own thoughts. Um, one issue you didn't address, though you did indirectly in your reference to lonely men in the, uh, uh, in the, in the clergy, is the whole issue of celibacy. And uh, that, of course, is a question, an issue that has been raised many times in many places. Um, I've, I've got a two part uh, question for you on that. Sure. Um, the first is what is your own position on the role of celibacy in the, in the whole abuse syndrome that you have um, so comprehensively laid out today. Uh, and, you know, there, there could be simple uh, social science experiments of this looking at, say, in, um, uh, in Germany, the, the difference in abuse levels between Catholics and Lutherans, where, um, uh, you know, the celibacy issue holds in one situation and not the other. So that, that's, that's the first half of the question. The second is, to try to understand why celibacy is important to the Catholic Church. When we, when we think back to the, uh, the, the origins of the papacy in, in the, the person of Peter, the rock upon whom I will build my church, we're told, of course, that Peter was married. Uh, Paul mentions it. Um, so can you help us to understand why celibacy is, is an important issue in the Catholic Church? And no one, of course, is pretending that this is the be all and the end all of explanation. But the argument is that it plays a role. It'd be interesting to, to hear your view of that. Oh, that's a very good question, David, and tomes have been written on it from several uh, <laughs> from several yeah. different angles, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to respond to both of them. First of all, there is very ample um, sociological and psychological evidence that celibacy does not contribute to sexual abuse, and it is not connected to predation or to pedophilia. Um, uh, we have, there's no direct line you could draw. People like to think there is, that if you're a celibate, there's a greater potential for uh, being an abuser. There is no evidence that this is true. What the problem that arises is, is not around celibacy, it's around uh, the politics of accountability. Um, how does one address the issue when it surfaces? How does one ascertain through the training of uh, priest to be whether the person has an appropriate level of psychosexual maturity. The actual number of pedophiles and ephebophiles is relatively proportionate to the percentage in society at large. It's the, it's the fact that the priesthood provided opportunities that didn't exist and that uh, really skillful and intelligent serial predators will have hundreds if not thousands of victims. So one predator can actually build up an extraordinary army of abuse. Celibacy can be a shield for them. It can be a protective uh, armor um, that somehow or other makes them seem less threatening, more welcoming, parents trust them more, or I did, I did at one point. Uh, this is all to misrepresent what celibacy means. The church's commitment to celibacy is at one level theologically and spiritually quite sound. At another level, it's rendered complicated by the fact that it took nearly a millennium for the church to enforce this as a discipline on its parochial or regular clergy. Mm -hmm. um, celibacy makes perfect sense if you're a monk. <laughs> And makes perfect sense if you're a friar. 
it doesn't make great sense if you're a regular pastor in a parish because celibacy as a gift is not tied to pastoral ministry. It can be, it can be, you can have celibate priests, Anglican celibate priests, Lutheran celibate ministers, for whom celibacy is, is a gift, for whom it frees them to do whatever they feel important in their ministry, and who may not be drawn to the married life. That doesn't translate into the fact that they're going to be predators by any means. But uh, when you impose a rule of mandatory or obligatory celibacy on a clergy that actually are molded in part on a template that is uniquely monastic and not pastoral in, in the sense we understand it now, then you end up with many of the problems that we have today. Uh, no one is arguing that, uh, you know, Jesuits and Benedictines and Capuchins and Franciscans should have celibacy as an option. They take vows of celibacy along with obedience and poverty. That's their choice, their religious orders. Um, but the regular clergy, the diocesan clergy, there are very few Catholics who are uh, <laughs> convinced that those priests should be required to be celibate. The, it is a requirement, it's a canonical requirement, it's what we call a, a discipline or a law. It can be overturned tonight if the Pope decides to overturn, he just writes a letter and that's it. Yeah, there's, it's, not, it's not a matter of dogma, it's not a matter of de fide. De fide, Catholics don't believe, uh, don't liken celibate clergy to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, they're not even at the same level. I mean, celibacy is a law of the church, a law that can be abrogated, rescinded, or changed at, uh, at papal will. And there are certainly uh, various bishops, uh, graver ones actually, um, who have been pushing for the ordination of what are called uh, viri probati, meaning mature married men to be ordained into the priesthood to serve various uh, constituencies that are simply not being served by celibate clergy because they're on the decline and they're in are insufficient numbers. So there's tremendous pressure within the church to revisit the issue of celibacy in the priesthood. The, the, the problem isn't around celibacy per se. The problem is around enforcing it as a legal requirement for ordination to the presbyterate for the regular clergy. That's the issue. That's the issue. And it does seem to me it's not an issue that's going away. And for whatever reason, the Catholic Church, um, in, globally speaking, seems to have some real difficulty uh, in being able to get its head around how to make that change. Because there are many people, and I'm sure you're aware of this, who have been United Church ministers, Presbyterian ministers, Congregationalist ministers, uh, priests of the Church of England, the Church of Wales, the Anglican Church of Canada, that make the decision for whatever reason to become Roman Catholics. When they do so, the Church may, the Roman Catholic Church, and often does, um, reordain them. And they're not asked to give up their families by any stretch of the imagination. So we, we actually have a married clergy. The Roman Catholic Church has a married clergy, um, a clergy from outside who come into the Catholic Church and what are called the, um, the Uniate churches, about 23, 24 of these churches, Ukrainian Catholic, Armenian Catholic, Chaldean, Maronite, Mar they all allow their, their clergy to be married, not their bishops, but the clergy to marry. They're all in union with Rome. So this is a uniquely Latin uh, and historically specific requirement that could be changed overnight if there was the will to do so. Pope Francis has asked bishops to speak to him. He's asked national conferences to discuss this, to make recommendations and whatnot, but for reasons that I can't quite figure, um, it doesn't have the traction it should. Hmm. That's a very long-winded response to well, it's a, it's, it's, David. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let, let me just press on one piece of the question, and that is, it seems to my reading, and I'm quite open to be corrected on this, that the New Testament has a much more permissive view of marriage amongst church leaders. I, I mentioned the example uh, of Peter, who of course is a rather important figure in, in terms of the papacy. Uh, and Paul too, in his writing, 
uh, acknowledges, uh, he says that it, 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 it could be better if you are single as I am, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's, it's okay if you're married. So I'm, I'm just wondering where the biblical basis uh, for celibacy uh, uh, comes from. Well, I think in part you vindicated it with the reference to the Pollan text. Um, and also, although the biblical warrant isn't there, um, that excludes um, ministers from um, taking marriage as part of their vocation, um, this evolved through the, the early church, um, or oh, through the centuries of the early church. It wasn't, and again, I, I uh, um, have to emphasize this, that it was only in the 11th century that the papacy really imposed unequivocally uh, mm. the uh, discipline of uh, celibacy and all clergy. And part of it was to uh, address what was known as the abuse, two abuses, one simony, the purchasing of offices, and the other nicahelism, meaning clerical concubinage. Uh, there were several priests who were married illegitimately or, or, or uh, had mistresses. <laughs> this was not uncommon. So the effort to bring some imposed uniformity um, on the regular clergy, as opposed again to the friars and the religious order priests and the monks, it's a different matter, it's a different matter, um, was an effort to introduce reform, actually, some regularity, reform, moral uh, control, but it was also with, not without its economic implications um, in relation to um, land, um, uh, priest families, um, accountability, um, uh, uh, the evolution of uh, the uniquely and universally imposed legal requirement for clerical celibacy for priests in diocesan clergy, okay, uh, it took a long time to settle in, and it's been it's been part of the church's practice for a good part of a millennium. Got to remember too, David, that the Roman Catholic Church never feels itself obligated to act only to bear biblical imperatives. There is a long history of reflection on tradition as an additional magisterial source, right? There's the mm. scriptures and there's tradition. In the reformed tradition, of course, scriptures, scripture plays a, a, a much more significant role. Now, since the Second Vatican Council and the rediscovery, as if you like, of the importance of the scriptures in the life of, of Catholic Christians has been an, an astonishingly wonderful illumination. And uh, many wonderful things have, have, have happened as a consequence of this. But I, I don't think, um, because no argument has ever been made to persuade them, that the Roman authorities would ever say, well, because earlier, early popes and um, uh, bishops and others were married, uh, therefore, that's a uh, legitimate requirement for the current ecclesial reality. Uh, they settled that question a long time ago. Mm, thank you. Other questions? Um, may I ask a question about the psychology? Sure. Any question you like. <clears throat> yes. Um, I'm just sitting here thinking of reflecting on the um, pride that may come into the equation. As Paula said, you know, it's probably better if you are not married, certainly mm -hmm. in view of the persecution that the early apostles and leaders were undergoing it was very dangerous and it's you do have more time to focus on the lord um <clears throat> when you don't have the extra responsibilities of family life i think that's a fair argument but i'm sitting thinking about um the the appeal to being just going that little bit further and the vocation being just a little bit higher and my own background is in psychology and that's why i'm i'm asking this question what what are your thoughts on that well, you know, in my own life, I mean, I was in the seminary at one point in the 1960s, and I have taught in faculties of theology and seminaries um, yeah. for decades, as well as uh, secondary universities with my primary presence. Um, 
I, I've met many celibate priests who are been freed by their celibacy uh, to give themselves generously to others. Their celibacy hasn't been a burden. Uh, yeah. They've sub sublimated their sexual energy in some way. They have not closed themselves down. They maintain close relationships with other men and with women mm -hmm. and have not compromised their chastity. I would say, however, that their number is small. Mm -hmm. That in the majority of, of cases of diocesan clergy with which I am familiar, celibacy has been a great burden for them. Yeah. They've struggled with it. It's not been a natural thing. They've accepted it as a condition for ordination. And sometimes it becomes too much for them. Many resign from active ministry and get married. Some live a double life. That's deplorable. Yeah. Some take to other forms of addiction, like alcoholism, to cope with their loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so psychologically, yes, but it depends very greatly on the nature of the, of the individual. The point is, we, it should be a choice. It shouldn't be legislated. I mean, that's the debate in the Catholic Church, um, that if you elect to, um, uh, to pursue ministry and you, you choose a celibate lifestyle, that's wonderful, and that will be effective in your ministry. But if you choose to be married either prior to ordination or subsequent to ordination, because that is who you are, and that's how you want to live your life, then that option should be there for you, and it will be an enrichment of the church, not a diminishment of it. Yes. So that's the, the, the question I think we, we need to continue to wrestle with. It's not that celibacy in and of itself is, is destructive, it's that celibacy is freely chosen. And in yes. the history of the church in relation to its diocesan clergy, they made it a legal requirement. And uh, as, uh, as a consequence, there've been all kinds of collisions, uh, psychological and otherwise, to try to live with that reality. For some, they've, they've been effective. And I say, I, I know many examples, but for many others, it's, it's been a, a lifelong burden. And one has to wonder about the wisdom of that. Now, in terms of the church structure, um, if the church makes the decision, the Catholic Church makes the decision to allow priests to marry, then it will have to rethink how it, how it handles their pensions, their benefits, their stipends, and everything else. There's a whole new world, right? So mm -hmm, my mm -hmm. sense is that we really need to start going in that direction and we need to recover what was known as the priest worker movement. In the early 1940s in France, even during the period of the French of the Nazi occupation of France, there was already a movement of priests to go to where um, Christ was no longer present. Mm -hmm. They had found that after the French Revolution and after the various upheavals of the 19th century and the early 20th century, that um, although many of the French aristocracy maintained connections with the Catholic Church, although there was a whole intellectual class that remained Catholic, and there were many landed um, farmers and others who saw themselves within the Catholic orbit, the, uh, the uh, working class was completely lost to the church. I mean, it was one of the many products of the revolution. They, they, the church was completely foreign to them. So many of the pre many priests decided that the best way of doing this was to take their ministry to them, to work with them in a plant. If they were working in an automobile factory, the priest would be there. If they were working in a steel company, the priest would be there. In a coal mine, he would be there. He would be where the people are. And he would live his life as a worker like any of them. But he would also be a priest, presiding on the Eucharist, hearing confessions, exercising his sacramental responsibilities. Unfortunately, uh, this experiment um, was suppressed by Pope Pius XII uh, for various reasons, some legitimate, some just out of fear. I think it needs to be revived. I think that the way forward is to create a priest worker movement uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church. In the Anglican Church, they have a, a system where they have the resident or incumbent rector or whatnot, and then several non-stipendary priests who are, are, or are attached to the parish, but they may be working in psychologists or teachers or music, musicians or whatever, but they exercise ministry, and uh, but they're not 
part of the immediate uh, parish administration. Um, and I think the finding uh, a Catholic equivalent, perhaps the priest worker movement would be the right way to move forward. And it would also raise the question again about how meaningful celibacy is as either a bridge to effective ministry or as an obstacle to effective ministry in, the, in a context like that. Right. Um, you're, you're, I was quickly unaware of this priest worker movement. Uh, it's a very interesting um, option. I hope it is looked at. Do you have any, and I'll just be very quick because other people have questions. Um, why Pope Pius XII happened to suppress the movement? Something might have gone wrong there. I'm just wondering, and I'm wondering how that fit into the whole hierarchical system of how you essentially move up the ranks. Um, uh, difficult for me to imagine cardinals out there working in the factory, just my final thought. Okay, I'm afraid that was a little unclear to me and it may have been, it may have been <laughs> the voice level. Uh, could you repeat the question again? Sure. I was just saying that I'd not heard of the priest worker movement. It's an interesting concept. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the result of it, I'm not sure, except you did say Pope Pius XII had it shut down. I'm yes, not, that is correct. <clears throat> I don't know why it was what did not work there. Although one thing that does come to mind very quickly is the uh, the structure of the, the hierarchical structure and then the structure of the curia, because how do you envision, how do I envision, how does anyone envision priest workers going up the ranks and wearing the red? That, I guess that's what I'm saying. What happened? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I, I think um, that Pope Pius XII was fearful of the regular intercourse, as it were, between uh, the worker priests and the community, that it would begin the process of breaking down the uniqueness um, of, of the priest and um, yes. removing him from his unique ontological status. I think mm -hmm. that's a serious mistake, frankly. And mm -hmm. I think the consequences of the suppression of the priest worker movement, uh, you could see in, in the French church in subsequent decades. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, if, if we have a lot of evidence of this from what are called um, ad limino or quinquennial visits between various bishops and the Pope, Every five years, a region of bishops will go off and make a, an accountability study, if you like, to the Pope and to the heads of his various curia departments, known as dicasteries. And um, he has made it um, quite clear there and in other specific writings that he, he welcomes initiatives for uh, reform and restructuring and rethinking from the different Episcopal conferences scattered across the globe. And he has received some, but mostly from Latin America. The American and the Canadian church have been depressingly shy or reluctant to do anything, it seems to me. But the, the Latin American church has been particularly fertile and bringing forward ideas and suggestions for dealing with um, different cultural and political realities on the ground and how they can strengthen um, the, the church's witness. And this is, does not obviate the fact or eliminate the fact that they also face many of the pathologies and other issues that um, are, if not rampant, certainly present in church life. But it, it does seem to me that they have several of their priorities clearer and, they, mm -hmm. and their bishops are bolder and responding precisely to what uh, Pope Francis has invited them to do. The German bishops, uh, similarly. Um, the American bishops are the most notoriously conservative of the Catholic hierarchies in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we're going to move them. I spent 10 years as a vice president of a large, second largest Catholic university on the East Coast. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how you move the American hierarchy unless you, you uh, reshape it. And they're in the process, the Pope is in the process of reshaping it. The recent consistory where he creates cardinals, is a very interesting term. Yes. The Pope does not elevate, <laughs> anoint cardinals, he creates them. Uh, one of the ones he created was the, card, was the now Cardinal Bishop of San Diego, 
who is, has a doctorate in political science from Stanford and a master's in art of history from Harvard University and is a major leader on social justice issues in the United States, but he's uh, one of a small number of voices. So the Pope is reshaping the American hierarchy, but he can only do so to the degree that he has the resources on the ground and he has to wait for them to get to retirement age and submit their letters of resignation unless there is an outstanding uh, problem when he can remove them. He rarely does that. He, he allows them to live out their, their tenure. And then in the majority of cases does not reappoint them. So he, he finds he's building up a pool of like-minded figures that share his uh, more progressive vision. Um, but it's a, it's a long process. Mm -hmm. uh, was that Cardinal McElroy that you referred to? Yes, that's is Cardinal that Rob, Bob, uh, Robert McElroy. Yes, that's yeah, exactly okay. who it is. That's, that's exactly that is, who yeah. it is. Well, you're <laughs> well connected. <laughs> Good for I'm you. spending a lot of time learning about the church. Uh, thank you for your generosity in responding to my questions and let me step back and allow others to have some time. Thank you so no, much. No, your questions are quite pointed and they're quite informed. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question in the area of accountability. Um, so Michael, um, the question is, uh, what happens in the process when uh, it has been discovered that a, um, a, a clerical person has been involved in sexual abuse? Uh, you, you write about that a bit more in your book, but you didn't say much about it in this talk. So, one of the controversies, of course, is where an abusing priest is moved to a new location where the people in that location don't, don't know his history and that sort of thing. You think of the Boston situation. But I'll, I'll turn it over to you uh, just on the accountability issue and uh, processing, um, I guess you could say, problem priests. Well, that's a very good question, actually, Gordon, and um, uh, you're correct. Um, the issue was and highlighted, if you like, in the film Spotlight, uh, particularly by Bernard Law, uh, his relationship to the Boston Globe, the huge uh, avalanche of uh, problems that emerged in the Boston Archdiocese, and then his being spirited uh, to Rome. Um, with very little accountability, really quite a scandal of the John Paul II uh, pontificate. I'm happy to say that that doesn't happen now. The Roman Catholic Church has learned very seriously from its mistakes. Um, most recently, the Pope has introduced legislation to hold bishops directly accountable for their failure to act on abusive priests, not just simply a matter of recommendation, not just simply a matter of saying, you know, this is what I want to do. No, no, they, if they fail to do it, they will be held directly accountable. Um, this hasn't happened before. There have been uh, all kinds of uh, legislation, both nationally and through the Vatican, that deals with the processes involved juridically uh, to ensure that um, a, uh, an abusing priest is removed from active ministry, uh, put um, on hold, uh, suspended. In some cases, if there's a trial uh, experience, uh, he will be uh, laicized. Uh, I gave the extreme example of Cardinal McCarrick as, as one, but there are many, many others as well. Uh, I was talking to a psychologist um, who said to me in England that the safest place uh, uh, for a child right now is in the Catholic Church. And uh, because it, of its safety protection mechanism, because it was burned so seriously that it, resp it responded immediately, putting, erecting in parishes, working with lay people, working with priests, setting up standards of accountability. Uh, if a priest is alleged to have committed something, he's immediately uh, removed from uh, office uh, until it is cleared up. He's not allowed, he's not moved to another parish. There's no uh, sending, well, we're going to send you outside the province or we're going to ask a bishop of another diocese to take you on. None of that happens now. So the current reality uh, regarding uh, abusive priests or religious personnel is um, much improved over the uh, early years when cover up and the prioritization of the reputation of the church 
over the sufferings of the victim, of the victims, was seen as a legitimate course of action. You've got to remember, too, and one of the uh, uh, cases where I, I do have a lot of sympathy for the bishops um, is, is they took advice, both from psychiatrists and from lawyers, advice which was wrong advice. The psychiatrists, more often than not, appeared not to have understood the high recidivist rate of uh, pedophilia. So they sent them off to these uh, institutes. We have one in, in uh, just north of Toronto called Southdown. They are all over North America where uh, uh, priests were sent who were suffering from various forms of sexual dysfunction. Um, and uh, they would go into these institutes, these centers, and then they would come back out. They would be given a clean bill of health by the directors. And then the, the bishops would put them back in active ministry. And several years or months later, they were right back to where they were in the first place. So uh, the recidivism rate um, for pedophiles, clinical pedophiles, and if, in the ephibophiles is quite high, number one. Number two, their lawyers. Well, their lawyers operated uh, on the working presupposition that the most important thing was to make sure that there was no vicarious liability. So the bottom line of the, of the diocese um, accounts took precedence over the imperatives of the gospel. So yeah. rather than addressing the issue directly and saying, okay, we need to work on this, find reparation, begin the process of, um, of appropriate compensation, they, they stalled. They stalled. They brought in teams of lawyers that advised them. They went through the courts and whatnot. And as a consequence, uh, the scriptures went right out the window. So I think now most bishops don't act, uh, it, it say, well, <laughs> okay, if something comes up and this, per, this individual has, this is a legitimate allegation, but it needs to be established in the court of law, he's no longer in active ministry. Structures will be put in place. You can phone the archdiocese. We have counselors and lawyers that will help you. And that more proactive response simply wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have happened without the destruction uh, that occurred in the in the previous two decades that the the church just simply mismanaged the file, and it mismanaged the file because a lot of the professional advice it it, it got and depended upon was in fact unreliable. So uh, in some respects, you got to remember bishops are not by training either. Um, there are bishops who are psychologists and physicians, but by and large, they're they're not trained in such a way, and they're not lawyers. If they are, they're canon lawyers, which is very different from civil law. And so they, they, they just turned to their advisors who are lay people and they were receiving advice which wasn't up to date. Advice they wouldn't necessarily give now. Maybe the lawyers, they would, they would because <laughs> several of them seem to be particularly inclined to litigation. But the psychologists and psychiatrists would be much more, much more uh, uh, circumspect in making recommendations around the process of healing and uh, the, the possibilities of curative therapy and things like that. So there's, the church has gone through this cauldron, if you like, of intense experience. And, and in many ways, it's learned its lesson. It's a, it's a model for other structures to learn from, um, but it hasn't solved all the issues. And I think for me, for what it's worth, the major problem is clericalism. It's not celibacy. It's clericalism. It's, it's the working belief that somehow the priest is uh, a species apart, exceptional. Um, I mean, uh, somehow inured to various things, uh, to be protected and to be venerated. Increasingly, that's not the case in the Catholic Church, but it's residual enough um, in various institutional ways to contribute to some of the problem. Because because in the end, sex abuse is, is not just about sexuality. In fact, most psychologists would tell us it is not primarily about sexual activity or performance. It's basically about power and fear. It's about, so if it's about power and fear, then how, how do we begin to create a culture in, in which priests in formation will be men of uh, integration, okay? And I'm not sure that the current seminary structure provides that. In fact, I think it's an incubator for uh, clericalism. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note 
that uh, in the opening speech at the Second Vatican Council in 1962, given by Bishop de Schmidt of Liege, uh, he talked about the curse of clericalism. Every pope since has talked about the curse of clericalism. That's a pretty strong use of, of words, right? The curse of clericalism, the disease of clericalism, the toxicity of clericalism. So we don't need to figure out that clericalism is not a good thing. We know it's not a good thing, but we don't seem to have worked out the strategies to, to correct it yet. Right? And uh, I, I see the sex abuse issue as just an extension of a clericalist mentality. Thank you, that was a very helpful answer. <clears throat> Are there any further questions? Yeah, no, no questions off the table. Any, any question you want to ask, please feel comfortable to do so. I'll dare one more quick question, Deborah, again. Okay. In terms of the solution to, or a, another thought on the curse of clericalism, could one turn to the gospel and reflect on Jesus' words about the preferences that um, were given others around the table and um, oh God being not a respecter of persons, the preferences of self is the danger. And it's kind of like, um, well, it feels a self-destructive thing for, for the clergy to argue that. And yet I wonder if there could be a measure of safety in that, I promise it'll be my last question. Thank you for listening. Uh -huh. There could be, I think, um, the, the uh, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, we, we don't have just simply the structures of accountability and power mediated. We also believe uh, profoundly in um, grace. And mm -hmm. it does seem to me, you know, that if, if in many cases, um, when you respond specifically to the outpouring of grace, no, how, no matter how you particularly define it, um, and you're open to the Holy Spirit, and you sit in communion, um, where you don't hierarchalize the ministries. I mean, St. Paul in several of the letters talks about what it is to be a member of the body of Christ. Um, the hierarchalizing of the ministries has contributed to the power imbalance, of course. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church is a hierarchical structure, but it is important to, to recognize that that shouldn't be its defining feature. At the Second Vatican Council, for instance, in the document Lumen Gentium, which is the primary document, foundational document of the church, discussion of the power of the hierarchy occurs in chapter three. Doesn't occur is the first chapter. Also, it's important to recognize that Pope Francis has spoken several times of the fact that the church is a pyramid, but that it's a, re it's a reversed pyramid. In other words, the Pope is at the tip of the pyramid, but the pyramid is tipped over. And it is the body of the church that needs to be served. And that the servants of the people are at the bottom of the hierarchy. You got to remember that one of the original titles, well, not original, but one of the titles that the Pope uh, assumed was uh, the uh, Suborum Servi uh, Deum, the servant of the servant of God. So I think uh, Pope Francis is quite keen on resurrecting that kind of radical ecclesiology. Now, <laughs> if you're a bishop, you're not usually accustomed to being at the bottom of the pyramid. You're accustomed to being near the top of the pyramid. So this calls for quite a shakeup. And that's what's happening in the Catholic Church right now, folks. Uh, as we prepare worldwide, globally, for what is called the Synod on Synodality, which will occur in 2023 in Rome, will be the event that I think that will define this pontificate and will bring us back to uh, where we were uh, uh, with the Second Vatican Council and um, uh, Giuseppe Roncalli, who is John the 23rd. Uh, in, in my view, um, uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio is the recapturing of the spirit of Giuseppe Roncalli. 
that we have gone now full circle back to John the 23rd. And this synod on synodality will be an effort to actually seriously implement the, the council. The, many council historians say, well, in the experience of the Catholic Church over the centuries, it usually takes about a century to implement a council. I mean, uh, councils are, are moments of great upheaval, right? But we live in the, in the 21st century, and we're an impatient time, and it's a disruptive time, and people don't wait a century. <laughs> so Francis seems to understand that. He's the disruptor pope. Well, that's, uh, I think, a very exciting and upbeat point to end, perhaps, today, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to uh, thank you for the widespread wisdom uh, that you have shared with us. As you know, uh, I'm not sure how many of the listeners are Catholics, but a number are not. So we, in a sense, have been looking in uh, as Protestants and learning very much uh, from uh, your, your knowledge, uh, finding what you say illuminating, thoughtful, uh, and uh, dare I say, the Catholic Church in Canada is lucky to have you. Uh, <laughs> I think there's some bishops that might not share that view. If I could take, I, uh, David, one quick uh, self-promotion moment here. I have a book on Francis called The Disruptor Pope that will be published um, after the Synod on Synod, so probably early in 2024 by the House of Anansi Press in Toronto. And um, the publishers want it very specifically for a large audience that is not limited to the ca to Catholics. So uh, if anything I've said strikes you of, of even marginal interest and you want to learn more about Pope Francis, uh, then I ask you to uh, hold off for a bit and wait for the book to come out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm shameless self-promoter. You, you have to be now. Nobody <laughs> publishing firms don't hire publicists anymore. You have to point okay, your own quite right. So, right. You well, that, that's an altogether different topic, uh, but an important one. Thank you too for your courage in addressing this issue that is so important, so painful, and and as you intimated, so hurtful uh, for. Uh, Catholicism and for the, the, the wider uh, Christian community, because as you also pointed out, these are not problems that are specific uh, to Catholicism, though perhaps they, they attract more press there. So thank you so much, Michael, and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. So I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience and your very fine questions. <laughs>